Cold Comfort Farm by Stella Gibbons, Chapter 2 Nevertheless, Flora wrote her letters the next morning. Mrs. Smiling did not help her, because she had gone down into the slums of Mayfair on the track of a new kind of brassiere which she had noticed in a Jew shop while driving past in her car. Besides, she disapproved so heartily of Flora's plan that she would have scorned to assist in the concoction of a single oily sentence. I think it's degrading of you, Flora, cried Mrs. Smiling at breakfast. Do you really mean <clears throat> you don't ever want to work at anything? Her friend replied after some thought. Oh, when I'm, when I'm 53 or so, I would like to write a novel as good as Persuasion, but with a modern setting, of course. For the next 30 years or so, I shall be collecting material for it. If anyone asks me what I work at, I shall say collecting material. No one can object to that. Besides, so I shall be. Besides, so I shall be. Mrs. Smiling drank some coffee in silent disapproval. If you ask me, continued Flora, I think I have much in common with Miss Austen. She, like, e she likes everything to be tidy and pleasant and comfortable about her, and so do I. You see, Mary, and here Flora began to grow earnest and to wave one finger about, unless everything is tidy and pleasant and comfortable about one, people cannot even begin to enjoy life. I cannot endure messes. Nor can I cried Mrs. Smiling with fervor. If there is one thing I do detest, it is a mess. And I do think you are going to be messy if you go and live with a lot of obscure relations. Well, my mind is made up. So there is no purpose in arguing, said Flora. After all, if I can find, I can, if I find I cannot abide Scotland or South Kensington or Sussex, I can always come back to London and gracefully give in and learn to work, as you suggest. But I am not anxious to do that, because I am sure it would be more amusing to go and stay with some of these dire relatives. Besides, there is sure to be a lot of material that I can collect for my novel, and perhaps one or two of the relations will have messes or miseries in their domestic circle which I can clear up. You have the most revolting Florence Nightingale complex, said Mrs. Smiling. It is not that at all, and well you know it. On the whole, I dislike my fellow beings. I find them so difficult to understand, but I have ti a tidy mind, and untidy lives irritate me. Also, they are uncivilized. The introduction of this word closed, as usual, their argument, for the friends were united in their dislike of what they termed uncivilized behavior, a vague phrase which was nevertheless defined in their two minds with great precision to their mutual satisfaction. Mrs. Smiling then went away, her face lit by that remote expression which characterizes the collector went upon the trail of a specimen, and Flora began her letters. The oleaginous sentences flowed easily from her pen during the next hour, for she had a great gift of the gab, and took a pride in varying the style in which each letter was written to suit the name of the recipient. That address to the aunt and Worthing was, was offensively jolly, yet tempered with a certain inarticulate public school grief for her bereavement. The one to the bachelor uncle in Scotland was sweetly girlish, and just a wee bit arch, it hinted that she was only a poor little orphan. She wrote to the cousin in South Kensington, a distant, dignified epistle, grieved yet businesslike. It was well she was pondering over the best style in which to address the unknown and distant relatives in Sussex that she was struck by the singularity of their address. Mrs. Mrs. Judith Starkadder, Cold Comfort Farm, Howling, Sussex. But she reminded herself that Sussex, when all was said and done, was not quite like other countries, and that when one observed that these people lived on a farm in Sussex, the address was no longer remarkable, for things seemed to go wrong in the country more easily and more frequently somehow than they did in, did in town, and such a tendency must naturally reflect itself in local nomenclature. Yet she could not decide in what way to address them, so she ended for by now it was nearly one o'clock, and she was somewhat exhausted by sending a straightforward letter explaining her position and requesting an early reply as her plans were so unsettled, and she was anxious to know what would happen to her. Mrs. Smiling returned to Mouse Place at a quarter after the hour and found her friend sitting back in an armchair with her eyes shut and the four letters ready, to po ready for the post lying in her lap. She looked rather green. Flora, what's the matter? Do you feel sick? 
at your tummy again, cried Mrs. Smiley in alarm. Oh, no, that is not physically sick, only rather nauseated by the way I have achieved these letters. Really, Mary, she sat upright, revived by her own words. It is rather frightening to be able to write so revoltingly, yet so successfully. All these letters are works of art, except perhaps the last. They are positively oily. This afternoon, observed Mrs. Smiling, leading the way to lunch, I think we will go to a flick. Give Sneller those, he will post them for you. No, I think I will post them myself, said Flora jealously. Did you get the brassiere, darling? A shadow fell upon Mrs. Smiling's face. No. It was no use to me. It was just a variation on the Venus design made by Waber Brothers in 1938. I had th It had three elastic sections in front instead of two, as I hoped, and I have it already in my collection. I only saw it from the car as I drove past, you know. I was misled by the way it folded as it hung in the window. The third section was folded back so that it looked as though there were only two. And would that have made it more rare? But naturally, Flora, two-section brassieres are extremely rare. I intended to buy it, but of course it was useless. Never mind, my dove, look. Nice hook. Drink it up and you'll feel more cheerful. That afternoon, before they went to the Rhodopus, the great cinema in Westminster, Flora posted her letters. When the morning of the second day brought no reply to any of the letters, Mrs. Smiley expressed the hope that none of the relatives were going to answer. She said... And I only pray that if any of them do answer, it won't be those people in Sussex. I think the names are awful, too, aging and putting off. Flora agreed that the names were certainly not propitious. I think if I find that I have any third cousins living at Cold Comfort Farm, young ones, you know, children of Cousin Judith, who are named Seth, or Reuben, I shall decide not to go. Why? Oh, because high-sexed young men living on farms are always called Seth or Reuben, and it would be just such, and it would be such a nuisance. And my cousin's name, remember, is Judith. That in itself is most ominous. Her husband is almost certain to be called Animus, and if he is, it will be a typical farm, and you know what they are like, Mrs. Smiling said somberly. I hope there will be a bathroom. Nonsense, Mary, cried Flora, paling. Of course there will be a bathroom, even in Sussex. It would be too much. Well, we shall see, said her friend. And mind you, wire me if you don't hear from them and decide to go there. If either of your cousins is called Seth or Reuben, or if you want any extra boots or anything, there are sure to be masses of mud. Flora said that she would. Mrs. Smiling hopes, Mrs. Smiling's hopes were dashed on the third morning, which was a Friday, Four letters came to Mouse Place for Flora, including one in the cheapest kind of yellow envelope, addressed in so barbed and illiterate a hand that the postman had some difficulty in deciphering it. The envelope was also dirty. The postmark was howling. There you are, you see, said Mrs. Smiling when Flora showed her this treasure at breakfast. How revolting! Well, wait now while I read the others, and we'll save this one for the, to the last. Do be quiet. I want to see what Aunt Gwen has to say. Aunt Gwen, after sympathizing with Flora in her sorrow and reminding her that we must keep a stiff upper lip, lip and play the game. Always these games, muttered Flora. And that she would be delighted to have her niece, Flora would be coming into a real homey atmosphere with plenty of fun. She would not mind giving a hand with the dog sometimes. The air of Worthing was bracing, and there were some jolly young people living next door. Rosedale was always full of people, and Flora would never have time to be lonely. Peggy, who was so keen on her guiding, would love to share her bedroom with Flora. Shuddering slightly, Flora passed the letter to Mrs. Smiling, but that upright woman failed her by saying stoutly after reading it, Well, I think it's a very kind letter. You couldn't ask for anything kinder. After all, you didn't think any of these people would offer you the kind of home, home you want to live in, did you? I cannot share a bedroom, said Flora. So that disposes of Aunt Gwen. This one is from Mr. McCang, father's cousin in Perthshire. Mr. McCang had been shocked by Flora's letter, so shocked that his old trouble had returned, and he had been in bed with it for the last two days. This explained, and he trusted that it excused his delay in replying to her suggestion. He would, of course, be delighted 
to shelter Flora under his roof for as long as she cared to fold the white wings of her girlhood there. The old lamb, crowed Flora and Mrs. Smiling, but he feared it would be a little dull for Flora, with no company save that of himself, and he was often in bed with his old trouble. His man, Hoots, the housekeeper, who was elderly and somewhat deaf, the house was seven miles from the nearest village that also might be a disadvantage. On the other hand, if Flora was fond of birds, there was some most interesting bird life to be observed in the marshes which surrounded the house on three sides. He must end his letter now, he feared, as he felt his old trouble coming on again, and he was hers affectionately. Flora and Mrs. Smiling looked at one another and shook their heads. There you are, you see, said Mrs. Smiling once more. They are quite hopeless. You would much better stay here with me and learn how to work. But Flora was reading the third letter. Her mother's cousin, South Kensington, said that she would be very pleased to have Flora, only there was a little difficulty about the bedroom. Perhaps Flora would not mind using the large attic, which was now used as a meeting room for the Orient Star in the West Society on Tuesdays and for the Spiritist Investigators League on Fridays. She hoped that Flora was not a skeptic, for manifestations sometimes occurred in the attic, and even a trace of skepticism in the atmosphere of the room spoiled the conditions and prevented phenomena, the observations of which provided the society with such valuable evidence in favor of a survival. Would Flora mind if the parrot kept his corner of the attic? He had grown up in it, and at his age the shock of removal to another room might well prove fatal. Again, you see, it means sharing a bedroom, said Flora. I do not object to the phenomenon, but I do object to the parrot. Do open the howling one, begged Mrs. Smiling, coming round to Flora's side of the table. The last letter was written upon cheap lined paper in a bold but illiterate hand. Dear niece, you are after your rights at last, what I have expected to hear from Robert Post's child these last twenty years. Child, my man once did your father a great wrong. If you will come to us, I will do my best to atone, but you must never ask me what for. My lips are sealed. We are not like other folk, maybe, but there have always been stark adders at cold comfort, and we will do our best to welcome Robert Post's child. Child, child, if you come to this doomed house, what is it to save you? Perhaps you may be able to help us when our hour comes. Your effect, Aunt J. Starkadder. Flora and Mrs. Smiling were much excited by this unusual epistle. They agreed that at least it had the negative merit of keeping silence upon the subject of sleeping arrangements. And... There is nothing about spying on birds in marshes or anything of that kind, said Mrs. Smiling. Oh, I do wonder what it was her man did to your father. Did you ever hear him say anything about a Mr. Starkadder? Never. The Starkadders are only connected with us by marriage. This Judith had a daughter of mother. This Judith is a mother, is a daughter of mother's eldest sister, Ada Doom. So you see, Judith really is really my cousin, not my aunt. I suppose she got muddled. And I'm sure I'm not surprised the conditions under which she seems to live are probably conductive to muddle. Well, Aunt Ada Doom has always ra was always rather a misery, and Mother couldn't abide her because she really loved the country and wore artistic hats. She ended by marrying a Sussex farmer. I suppose his name was Starkadder. Perhaps the farm belongs to Judith now, and her man was carried off in a tribal raid from a neighboring village. And he has to take her name. And he had to take her name. Or perhaps she married a Stark Adder. I wonder what has happened to Aunt Ada. She'd be quite old now. She was fifteen years or so older than Mother. Did you ever meet her? No, I am happy to say. I have never met any of them. I found their address in a list of in Mother's diary. She used to send them cards every Christmas. And that is where we will pause. <laughs>